I more than welcome you all to this session. I can imagine how much fun and how much clarity you have been receiving through the panel sessions, the, all the speakers that you have experienced, the incredible um, ideas that have been pushed across the last session between Omilola and Benga, amazing clarity, usable, transferable. You know, I can only um, remain optimistic, excited, you know, and clear, you know, about the impact of all of this in your life. I feel really excited to be here. I want to thank the host, um, Omilola Oshikoya, uh, amazing, gentle um, husband, Benga Osh uh, Oshikoya, and all the team behind the scene um, who make all of this happen. Thank you all for inviting me. It's such a honor to be the keynote speaker here today. I, I have no words to really capture the ideas of my heart. I have prayed, so I will save you from praying again. Right, so we'll just be good, right? I have taken time to really think about the audience and think about you, and I've tried to rent a space in your head without your permission. I do pray and hope that that will find a lot of expression in this session by God's grace, okay? So, um, we are living in very interesting times. We are living in amazing times. There's so much going on in the world today the temptation is to get very logical, is to get very proactive and just assume that this is one of those, you know, crisis is a constant, you know, no event, no history, no pain, no gain type of experience, such that you then have succor from the motivation that if you hang on, if you stay in there, you know, if you keep your head, somehow everything will work together. You will find your next level of power. You will be strong at the other side, you know, of the tunnel. Truly, those ideas are real. Those ideas are true. Those ideas work. But you see, there is a big difference be between the principles that govern reality and the peculiar experiences that govern it at the same time. Principles by design are universal, but experiences are peculiar. At times, we have to limit our exchanges to the, you know, application um, of the universality of principles. But there comes time um, in the human condition that we have to transcend the limits of principles and embrace the weight of the peculiarity of experience. So I would say that principles are universal, but experiences are peculiar. And the, the peculiarity of experiencing experiences that we are engaging globally today call for a new type of positioning. They call for a new type of clarity. They call for a new type of thinking. They call for a new type of engagement. This is the time more than ever to get out of what is called no knowledge and the weights of known experiences and begin to challenge ourselves to consider the possibilities that are trapped in the potential that we carry as human beings and then as purposeful individuals sent on a mission on earth to fulfill a certain um, idea and to spread that idea within a time frame and of course for, for as, as extensive and expansive as it can get. Right, they say that um, um, you should let sleeping dog lie. I'm sure you've heard that before. That honestly will be true last year, it will be true two years ago, it will be true five years ago, ten years ago, but it will not be true in 2020 and the years after it. Let sleeping dog lie, but not by your side, right? <laughs> because essentially. You don't know what the dog is thinking about. The dog can be seemingly sleeping and is dreaming and is imagining a bone and your leg is the closest and it's just going to go for your leg. The idea is to sustain a type of positioning 
such that you take responsibility for your space under the sun and you refuse to suffer because of the ignorance of those who operate within your area of influence, right? So, or your circle of influence. You need to be able to keep unguardedness and foolishness at arm's length such that the choices of the people around you can remain theirs. The consequence of those choices can remain theirs as well because you sustain a credible, independent posture that pretty much sets you free from the choices and excesses, nuances, whims, and caprices of those around you, and your destiny is pretty much subject to three things that you control on a daily basis, your hand, your brain, under God. And when you are alive to that type of demand, right, you, you, you can envision differently and embrace the freedom to think, the freedom to dream, but most importantly, the freedom to lock in a type of identity in the world, right? Those are great statements that you could hear two years ago, you could hear in 2019, and all you need to do is to document them in your book, all right, in your journal or your journal, and just have the confidence that I should just stay true to these things. What has now happened is that a new song is going on, and a new type of reality has visited us. So whether we like it or not, we are dealing with two things. We are dealing with an unplanned interruption. We are dealing globally with an unplanned interruption. Again, we are then dealing with numbers. And we are in a time of great numbers. And those numbers essentially are very critical, as critical to how we interpret what I've said time and again is that what is coming will come. It is how we see, how we hear, and how we interpret that will make the difference. Difference is a very critical idea. This life does not re recognize you nor reward you for your similarities. You are rewarded for your difference. Your difference is your critical success factor. Your difference is your critical relevance factor. Your difference is your critical greatness factor. You know why marriages fail a lot of times? You know why business partnerships don't work a lot of times? You know, part of why they don't work essentially is because those associations are negotiated based on similarities and not on difference. I mean, you have scriptures like two cannot work together except they agree. And what has happened through time is that people have interpreted that to mean two cannot work together except they are the same, right? And so when we negotiate compatibility, somehow from our subconscious, we negotiate from the point of view of similarity, the pursuit of similarity, not of difference. And so you want to look for people who align with you, who agree with you, pretty much who are like you. But that is the recipe for disaster. And that is why partnerships are not working. Businesses are not working. Friendships are not working. Excuse me, if I could get something to with my face, I'll really appreciate that. I'm sorry. I know that's not part of the script, but I don't want to explode. Boom. <laughs> right? I'm sweating. Okay, so um, you, you, so people negotiate that based on difference, and people negotiate based on similarities. But where we pick that scripture from, did not say two cannot work together, except they are the same. <laughs> it says two cannot work together except they agree, except they agree. And agreement has nothing to do with similarities. Agreement can define our different, we can be two different people and agree on certain protocols that we can work with, some do's and don'ts or some rules that pretty much help us right, to, uh, to take decisions, interpret our realities better, right, um, look at life better, and think better, pretty much. When we learn to think that way, we create power, you know, at a level, we, we, we access synergy at a level, right, unprecedented, probably even unthinkable, 
But the common thinking is that similarity is the strength that we must plug into. And I want you to know today that the conversation for the next 45 minutes or 40 minutes is going to be based on the authenticity of your journey. And you have to come, we all have to come to that place of strength where we resist the temptation to embrace commonalities and, and the generic, right? And to be that which anyone can be. Rather, to begin to focus on what people are not willing to be, are not willing to do, or are not prepared to do. Because life will not reward you for your similarities. Life will not recognize you for your similarities. You will be recognized, rewarded for your difference. And a study has shown that those who copy, right, those who copy people usually miss the genius of who they are copying. Rather, they focus on the eccentricity and the weaknesses of the person. So you see people trying to wear their cap like the person. They try to make their hair like the person or wear a kind of suit that is the color that is more predominant with the person. All of that captures the container of the person, not the content. Genius does not come from container because the best container can do is to house the content. So the genius is assessed based on the weight of content and content becomes the critical difference in people. What defines our commonality is clear. Our commonalities are clear. We all have eyes. We have hands. We have fingers. We have legs. We have nose. We have lips. We have a dentition. We all have all of that. All of those are our similarities. But though you and I have all of that in common, it is how mine is arranged, my difference, the difference of the shape of my nose, of my eyes, of my fingers, that will make you know this is Ola Kunle and not James Coburn. That's how you are going to know, right? Now, it is the similarity of, of, it is the difference, the uniqueness of that which we seemingly share together that defines my strength. It is those kind of ideas that I'm trying to communicate to us today. Now, let me take this to um, the, uh, let me stretch this a bit. So, in the Bible, there's this gentleman called Cain. And what had happened to Cain was the, the Lord asked Cain, I mean, Cain, he didn't ask them to do it, actually, but he did it. Both Cain and Abel offered a sacrifice to the Lord from the abundance of their daily endeavors and engagement. They brought the best, most prized, you know, instruments within their, you know, arsenal to sacrifice to the Lord. And the Lord looked onto the sacrifice of Abel favorably and accepted the sacrifice, right? But he rejected the sacrifice of Cain. Cain was livid, angry, jealous, envious rather, and then he decided to kill his brother. And he actually killed his brother. And that be began a different cycle for the destiny of Cain. Before that, a gentleman has also lived. His name was Adam. And this Adam and his wife, Eve, pretty much plugged the whole world into whatever crisis that we know today. Name the crisis on any level. The unguardedness began between the unguardedness, right there within the unguardedness of Adam and Eve. But their foolishness was pretty much predictable. And God himself suspected, really, that they may make choices that may be consistent with the type of outcomes that we are seeing today. So he prepared for that, you know, which is why God in his awesomeness is able to make all things to work together for our good. All things work together for our good because your mistakes and your errors and your frailties and imperfections does not shock God. Rather... He anticipates them and he prepares for them such that in a given situation, God is all-knowing to know that there are five options before you. There are five ways you can address a particular issue. And God knows that if you see, God does not prepare for your best choice. 
God doesn't wait for you to choose the best of the five or the best of the seven so that he can now walk with you and begin to do damage control in case they are wrong. That's not how God works. The way God works is that there are five options before you. Whichever one you take, for each one that you take, there is a plan for it. If you take option one, there is a plan from God for that. If you take option two, there is a plan for that. Three, plan for that. So for your five options, there are five different responses. All of them are supposed to lead to one goal. So if the plan of God is to take you out of this room and to give you a bar of gold, what God will do is that on the, at the door to all the five doors that take you out of this room, out of this you know, environment, there will be a bar of gold there. Whichever door you open, there's a bag, gold, a bag of gold waiting for you. The idea that all things work together for good is that God can go ahead of your errors and your frailties and your imperfections, knowing that planet Earth does not have the capacity to sustain perfect behavior. The one who can be perfect has not been born, will never be born. If you negotiate your peace based on perfect behavior, you will never have peace. If you insist that only through perfect behavior will you have a good relationship with your wife or your spouse or with your staff or your team or with your friends or your children, you are going to have to wait forever and by your own hand initiate attacks that will self-destruct you, that will pretty much limit you on many levels. The idea is that peace cannot be tied to perfect behavior because planet Earth does not have the capacity to sustain peace. Therefore, something superior must guide you on a daily basis. Part of that is to know that peace is superior to justice. Every time you pursue your justice, you trade your peace for it. And some people have fought for their justice so much, they have no peace left. That is true in marriage, that is true in teaming in the office, that is true for friends, that is true for business partners, that is true in different relationships. The idea is you cannot hold people down to your rules. So many people fight and quarrel and debate unnecessarily, not because they don't know that they are not perfect, but somehow there is a wretchedness of the human condition that pretty much tolerates the height of your own foolishness and the depth of your nuisance, but cannot for a second tolerate that of others. That is why if you have a car and you give the car to your friend to drive and he decides he made a mistake and he bashed the car, a part of your mind feels well, it's because you gave him the car to drive. That maybe if you have driven the car yourself, the car will not be bashed. That is the wretchedness of human thinking because that's not true. The car can be, in fact, it can be snatched from you by arm robbers or something. The idea is that if you give people money, so used to, maybe you give somebody money to do business and then the money did not work and then they are owing you and then you go over them and you, you know, and then you want to kill them, you get the police, you harass them, you embarrass them and do all of that. You know that that same money, if arm robbers had robbed you at gunpoint, they shot other people and collected the money you will be too glad that you are alive to remember that money. If you lose that money yourself in business, you forgive yourself real quick. So there is a wretchedness in us that pretty much have the capacity to tolerate our own unguardedness and frailties, but resist that of others. And that is the poverty of the human condition. Whichever way, the idea is we got to come to a place where you transcend the limits of perfect behavior. Please stay with me. You transcend the limits of perfect behavior. You outgrow the blocks of rights and wrongs. You know why most people cannot do business? You know why they fail in business? Why they cannot handle evil in business? Why they cannot sit on the same table with evil and curate their own good on the same table with evil? People have a lot of expectations, you know. They surround themselves with good people, with people like them, and they expect the highest of rewards. It's impossible. If you are a good person, and the only way you can do business is to have good people on your table, there is a limit to what type of capacity you can grow and what type of outcomes you can create. Why? Because on the table of power, at the highest level of human expression, it is a navigation of good and evil. The Bible did not say that goodness, you shall, you, um, it sets a table before you in the, in, the, in, the, in the presence of your friends <laughs> or in the presence of good people. He said it prepares a table before you in the presence of your enemies. 
your adversaries. It means that there is a level of exchange. There is a food, and when I say food, I don't mean physical food, but there is a new trend in life you cannot be given the opportunity to consume except you are willing to sit on the same table with evil and use your wisdom to humble evil such that even evil begin to look unto you for inspiration. And when you become the mentor of evil, there's something called matter manipulation. You, be, you have the capacity to manipulate matter. Matter is anything that has weight and occupies space. You must grow your capacity to be able to manipulate that, right? The difference is why you are doing it. Both the fool and the wise, the wicked and the strong and the weak are all going to move in the direction of manipulation. The difference will be why they are doing it. So you got to come to that place where you can sit on that table that is prepared before you, but in the presence of your enemies. Part of how that works, guys, part of how that works is to come to a place where you transcend the limits of right and wrong, the limits of good and evil, to understand that there are still higher blocks, parallel universes to those popular ideas about human engagement. Part of that is, for example, if God had limited his thinking to good and bad, right and wrong, he would never have been able to save man. He would never have been able to save man because Jesus did not commit any crime. When Jesus came to the world, he was innocent, so he should not die. It was wrong for Jesus to die by any standard. Logically, it was wrong for an innocent man to die for sinners. It was wrong for an innocent man to die for criminals, right? To die for the wrong. It is wrong for him to die. It was right for him to live. <laughs> so on the bracket of right, it was right for Jesus to live. On the bracket of wrong, it was wrong for Jesus to die. Therefore, God, who wanted to save the world, had to transcend the limits of right and wrong and move to the needful. And move to the needful. That is why there's no scripture that said it was right for Christ to die or wrong. Or then he said it was needful that he died, because the needful is superior to right and wrong. And there are some seemingly wrong things that are needful, and there are right things that are wrong because they are not needful. These are symposium discussions that I wish I have time to break down. But I will teach you further by letting you know that, for example, if armed robbers come to your house today and you are hiding in a part of the building where nobody can see you, you know that if they call your name for 50 years, they will not see you there. If they bring a gun and search anywhere, they will not see you there. But let us face it. By the meaning of lies, if lies mean to distort the facts, assuming that's the meaning of lie, you are actually distorting the fact that you are in the room. You are lying to the arm robbers that you are in the room, really, because you are in the room. If you really want to pass the test of technicality of right and wrong, you should come out and say, I'm here. Let God be true. Let all men be liars. And you know what's going to happen? They are going to shoot you, and guess what? You are going to die. And you know what God is going to say? God is going to say, welcome, foolish but faithful servant, really, because you are supposed to understand that those brackets cannot capture the whole ex essence of human exchange. There is a level of clarity and intelligence you come to where the mastery of right and wrong determines the favor you get with man. But when it comes to destiny sensitivity, the mastery of right and wrong alone is a limitation. You must have another helicopter view, which is seeing the world from the needful. If God had seen the world from right and wrong, he would stay in his justice and lose the world. But God had to transcend the limits of right and wrong and know that it was needful for him to die. And for him to do that, he had to come down to meet man and die even though he committed no sin. Not because it is right, not because it was wrong, but because it was needful. The needful is that you are hiding in that roof. You are, you are deceiving the robbers, but unto what? That's why Paul said, oh crafty fellow that I am, I took you in by deceit. Oh crafty fellow, King James Version, oh crafty fellow that I am, 
I took you in by deceit. You must ask yourself, how can an apostle use such a word? Crafty, uh, deceit, how can he use such a word? Those are words that criminals should use, that wicked people should use. But you must understand that there is a level of instrumentation that transcends the limits of popular virtue. And so it takes a lot of planning to succeed, a lot of time management to succeed, a lot of scenario planning and project management to succeed, to be the CEO of a bank, to be the head of a corporation, to be a good husband and a faithful wife. Those principles are critical. The same principles are critical to be a successful criminal. You don't rob a bank by just posing, no. To rob a bank successfully, you need to be a superior project planner. You need to, be a, a, to, to set goals. You need to be superior scenario manager. One of the biggest project managers in human history was Adolf Hitler, right? He managed an entire world war. The same principles that deliver foolishness deliver wisdom. You must understand that these are different sides of the same coin. And there is a new sense to skills, right? Skills have their new sense value. The same gun that can hunt in the jungle can kill a child, right? The same instruments that deliver good can deliver evil. Human consciousness must be disciplined at a level to understand that which defines man, that limits man, but to operate from a spiritual clarity that transcends the limits of the human condition. That is when we are aligned with the creator and instrument, I mean, orchestrating his justice on earth. Those kind of things cannot be done from the limits of, I need to buy a car, I need to live in a house, I'm going to turn 40. You know, I hear people say, you know, I even hear a preacher saying, if you are 40, you know, and you don't have a house of your own, you are this, you are that. You see, a lot of times when we open our mouth to talk, and then we have an audience we are talking to, you look at that scenario, and what you see is a lot of dead bodies trying to enter one coffin. Essentially, ignorance calling to deeper ignorance and seeking comfort within the sea of ignorance. What does that produce? Concentrated foolishness. And people become determinedly on a wrong path. I mean, people are sincerely in jail. People are sincerely poor. People are sincerely frustrated. People are sincerely stupid because sincerity is not a factor of production. Go check it. Land, labor, capital, entrepreneur. You can't find sincerity there. Sincerity, again, is not an independent variable. It is a dependent one. If all you have is sincerity, you will be used, abused, taken for granted, cheated, dumped in this world. Just like hope. People say, I got to keep remain hopeful. Yes. People say, hope make it not ashamed. But if you go back to the same scripture, you see that they've listed some things that you must add to perseverance. Add this and add that and add that and add that. And the last thing was add hope. Then hope make it not ashamed. So it's not hope, the independent quantity. That does not make it not a shame, but hope added to those other things does not make it a shame. If all you have is hope, the Bible also says, hope make the heart sick. What is doing the making? The same hope. You see, hope deferred make the heart sick. Hope sustained unnecessarily, not converted to results within a time frame, will be the very instrument designing your weariness. Because hope has capacity to make. Hope has capacity to design. Hope has ca capacity to brew. And when you sustain hope alone as an independent variable, and you sustain it too long without the conversion to outcomes, the same hope will, will be the designer, the brewer of your weariness and your frustration. That is why we got to come to a higher level of exchange where we see differently understand differently, interact differently. If we come back, therefore, to the idea about justice, you see how the, over, the, the unnecessary focus on justice compromise your peace. But that is the level you have to be to hold yourself to lower standards and hold everybody to the standards of your head. You hold yourself to the standard of the truth of your heart and of your conscience, but you hold everybody down to the rules of your head. In other words, you will deal with yourself with more empathy, and you will deal with others with, that, with less empathy. In other words, you pretty much have mastered the silly art of judging everybody by the uniqueness of your own graces. 
What I say every time is don't confuse what is easy for you to do for what is easy to do at all. Don't confuse what is easy for you to do for what is easy to do. Some things are so easy for you to do. You are so blessed with the way you grew up, the parents that taught you, the environment you grew up in, the school you went to. All of those things have evoked for you a type of privilege, some type of grace that allows ease to visit you at a level. However, that is not for you to hold people around you down to that same level. I used to be like that. I used to hold people down to my rules. I feel I can do this. I walk two nights without sleeping. I stay all night working on a document two nights, three nights without sleeping. That's so why I, I harassed my team. Why can't you get that done? Why can't you get that done? You get that done. Until I had to grow. I had to mature to understand that, no, you are holding them down to your rules. What is easy for you to do is not necessarily what is easy. The ease you experience does not define ease for everyone. So you need the maturity to not confuse what is easy for you to do for what is easy for everybody. It is easy for you, but it is tough for many people. That type of thinking will unlock a gratitude inside of you. It will help you to hold complex models in your head in a simple format and keep you human and keep you fresh and simple. You see, I said all of these things because you cannot negotiate from perfect behavior. The moment you begin to do that, you begin to permit yourself to a sense of entitlement that pretty much cannot find comfort only in what you do, but find reading in what others do. You see, there's popular envy. The idea that whatever I have, you know, is great for me. And whatever you have is great for you, but I don't want you to have it. I don't want you to have what you have. I know what I have. I'm excited about what I have, but I don't want you to have what you have. That is popular envy. That type of envy cannot be hidden. If your people around you are observant enough, they will see it in your countenance. They will see the way you look at them. They will see the way you posture. They will know you don't really care and you are envious of them. But there is a more lethal type of envy. I call it strategic envy. You know what that one says? That one says, I'm happy with what I have, yeah? But I'm even happy for what you have. I want you to have all you have. I celebrate you for what you have. And I mean it. It's true. I really want you to have all that you have. Your car, your house, your wife, your children. I'm excited that you have all of them. I don't just understand why I don't have it. You see, that one can be your wife. It can be because that type of posture is not visible. It's right inside. And it can be the closest person to you. It can be your mom. It can be your dad. It can be your children. It can be your best friend. I don't mind all you have. I'm happy you have it. I don't just understand why I don't have it. You see, you get those kind of thinking when you have not learned the superiority between peace and justice. And part of that, I'm going somewhere, please. And part of that is to understand that those things also permit you, apart from permitting you to embrace that strategic type of envy and to unlock it inside of you, because even in good people, even in good people, the potential for evil on a large scale exists. Even in good people, if you permit the nuggets of life and the nutrients of life to press the wrong button inside of you, you will come out at the other side a beast if you permit it. And the humility to know that that is possible in itself keep you sane and balanced in your own world, right? But what it also does is it releases you to the material realm where things become the determinant of the issues of your life, of the purpose, or of the meaning of your life. That is the only reason why some people are so poor. All they have is money. I mean, you take away money from their life, they have nothing else. They are drifting, clueless, uncertain, unsure, double-minded, tired, weak, full of envy, and seeking comfort in the smallness that defeats others. Those kind of people cannot assess their value until they see the car they drive or the car you drive. They cannot find truth anywhere until they see the house truth is living in. They see the type of swimming pool there, the kind of jacket he has on, the kind of shoes or watch, or the person is flying business class or economy class. They must find something that is a thing that is a symbol, something crass, something material as the instrument that will help them to fit into that moment. 
and to fit everybody around them into that particular moment is a small way of living. Those are the people who are not respectful people. Instead, they are respecters of persons. It means that they need to value you and put a value on all that they see and assess before they can unlock their honor or unlock their respect towards you. In other words, if you are not the chief executive, if you are not the boss, if you are not driving the type of car, they cannot unlock their sense of honor towards you. A respectful person does not do that. It will unlock that regardless of who you are because it's respectful. What it takes to be disrespectful is not in him. So whether it's an ant or a dog, because the Bible says if the righteous is kind to his beasts, even if it's a dog, he will show respect. If it's a security guard, he will show respect. If it's a CEO, he will show respect because he's a respectful person. Why have I gone in all this direction? I've gone there and I could continue. But part of that is to understand the wretchedness of the human condition. That was the weight that was on Cain in that moment where he could not handle the approval of his brother by God and his brother's sacrifice. And he had to seek his own meaning in the impact he can create for and with his brother. You see, I need to show you something very critical here. When you get into it, you see that there is a big problem. There was a big problem with Adam. Adam was not born. What people have said again and again, and even the Bible attests to on a level that a lot of people don't understand, is that Adam is the first man, but is not the perfect mold of us. Adam did not have the privilege of biology. As far as I'm concerned, when I look for the, 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 the first human being that is like you and I, that is like the, the, the you and I that we know, it is Cain and Abel. Because Cain and Abel were the first human beings to experience biology, right? Um, Adam did not experience the privilege of growth. He did not experience the privilege of birth. Adam was not born, he was made. God did not give birth to man, he made man. And then made man, gave birth to men. So you have two human beings. One is the first man, yes. The second is the second human being, yes. But the third and the fourth guys were the human beings in our own texture, in our own make and design. Why? Because they were the ones that were born. Adam was not born. Adam was made, and so he missed all of the new trends of development. The Bible said, therefore, when Jesus was going to come, the obvious gap in the life of Adam had become clear, which was Adam was not born, so he missed procreation, he missed growth, and so he did not learn obedience by anything. He accepted responsibility for adulthood from day one. He was susceptible to error. Part of why it was necessary that the sacrifice of the lamp was prepared just in case Adam did not eat the tree of life and he embraced the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because of the gap in his emergence. He missed the due necessary experiences of growth. God had to prepare that substitute because he makes all things work together for good. Part of what has then happened to Cain and Abel was that they had that experience of growth. When Jesus was going to come to redeem man, that's why he had to be born. He couldn't be made. He couldn't just appear on the scene. And the Bible acknowledged what I'm saying by emphasizing that Jesus, with all he went through, learned obedience. That was the critical difference between Adam and Christ. Adam did not learn obedience, right? Jesus had to learn obedience. He was God. He had to be born through biology, like you and I, and then he had to go through all that we went through. First of all, so that he can connect to the feelings of our infirmity and empathize at the level that can give freedom, but also in addition to that is that he could perfect the, the necessity of principles, the mastery of his faculties as a human being, not just as God, right? That was what was missing in the life of Cain. Now, let me show you Cain and why it is important in the next, I have about five, five minutes more, God help me. But listen to this. Cain, therefore, had a privileged relationship. Cain had a relationship with God. He had a walking, talking relationship with God. He was talking to God. 
Even when he killed someone, God was still talking to him. That's another level. I, I, I wish I had time to explain that access to you. But even in the midst of his highest nuisance, where he had killed his brother, God still came and God was talking to him. So there is a sense in which you can have a spiritual conditioning that guarantees you access at a level and you are relating at a level, but you can be manifesting a level of degeneration a level of wretchedness at the same time that does not cut you away from God, but pretty much put a lead on your expression. So what Cain was suffering was not annihilation from God. What Cain was suffering was a suboptimal relationship with God, and then he had to hustle. Hustle is not the will of God. Hustle is a compromise of the spiritual condition. People have their own hustles today. They say, my hustle, my hustle. Hustle is toiling. You are not supposed to hustle for anything. You are supposed to position. Hustle is a consequence of the fall. And hustle was the judgment. It was part of the judgment that came upon Cain when Cain was unguarded. Now, what is happening to people today, even at the so-called level of relation, spiritual relationship, is that they are able to function like Cain. There is a spiritual condition that allows them to talk to God on a daily basis, but there is also a flawed condition which is a moral issue that incubates their nuisance on a daily basis. They are living 100% in sin, and they are also living on maybe 10% with God. So there is a communication with God, which is huge. To be able to talk to God and hear God, which is huge. But it wasn't enough to arrest or to govern the thinking of, of Cain or to govern his behavior. Now, how does that, what does that mean for 2020? You see... This 2020 is a test of so many things. I will rush through this very quickly. First of all, there is the place of numbers. The Bible says, um, I'm going to teach you, you have to learn to number your days. Why? So that you can apply your heart to wisdom. You have to learn to number your days so that you can apply your heart to wisdom. In other words, if you miss the numbers of your life, there is a dimension of wisdom you cannot assess or release, right? That's why the Bible says, teach us to number our days. That, which means, why? Teach us to number our days. Why? That we may apply our hearts to wisdom. There is an application and an alignment to wisdom we lose when we also lose consciousness of the numbers of life. There are so many numbers in life. Five is the number of grace. Seven is the number of perfection. All kinds of numbers exist. Three is the number of, the, of, 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 of Trinity. There are different numbers in life. But there is a number that is not documented in theology, and it's the number 500, and it's 500 years, right? Every 500 years, something unprecedented, unplanned, unimagined happens in the church. It impacts directly on our theology, and then it goes from the church into society to affect popular culture, to disrupt popular culture and to install another way of thinking and of relating and exchanging in popular culture. The last 500 years, and go check it, it's not my idea, it's clear in different theories and research and studies, Google it, every 500 years of the church, you see it there. But every 500 years, the last one was 1517 Martin Luther Reformation. The Martin Luther Reformation was the last 500 years in 1517, the reintroduction of the spiritual life to faith, and that the righteous shall live by faith. The righteous shall live by his own faith. Before that time, we're paying for everything, paying for access to God, paying for forgiveness, paying for everything. And then this guy came with that theology, and that began something awesome in the church that disrupted the entire church space as it was at that time. But it did not stop there. It went into popular culture to shape culture. How? That movement, not my view, go check it, these are facts. That movement actually went on to create everything we call free inquiry today. Began from 1517 Martin Luther Reformation. Everything we call little government began from that particular reformation, 1517. Everything we call democracy began from that particular experience. That experience pretty much changed the world forever, right? Every 500 years, something of such weight happens, including the arrival, birth, and death of our Lord Jesus Christ itself. But if you push further, 
2017 was the end of that 500 years, actually. 2017 was the end of that 500 years, and 2018 was the beginning of another 500 years. We are about two years into that 500 years. The weight of that 500 years is huge. This afternoon, somebody asked me a question. What is the destiny of the human being in 300 years' time? I doubt if he will be here, was my response. I doubt if man will be here. I said, because of the, if I analyze the force of artificial intelligence and the dangers it promises, I see an implosion within man. Not because man will fail in the creation and mastery of his technology and his science and his art, he will continue to succeed there. But there is the progress we make technically as we succeed, but there is the retrogression we make morally as we fail. So you can have technical success and moral failure, right? So you need to have a balance of technical progress and moral progress. The human condition is progressing technically and failing morally. And so I foresee an implosion of the human condition, right, where if you are not careful, humans can be the pets of machines, but at a higher level, both machines and man become endangered in the hand of another force. I can tell you for free, slap me all you want, kill me all you want, but whether you like it or not, ideas like one government are guaranteed for the human condition. If I have time, I will show you, and I will not quote any scripture. Just by what is going on in the world today, one government is sure. The Hunger Games movie that you saw, right? There is Hunger Games society that you need to understand at another level that we may not have time to break down for you today. But quite frankly, there's something like that. You see, in the world we know today, there is a codependence between the 99% and the 1%. In the new world ahead, there is a dependence of the 99% on that 1%. Hunger Games right there. Hunger Games will define businesses, markets, families, homes, and all of that. The next colonization will be voluntary. Nations of their own accord are going to submit to other nations without bombs, without bullets, without armies. Nations are going to fail in defining their socioeconomic and political realities, and they are going to submit themselves to other nations and say, take us as a state in your nation. Our president will become a governor. Our governor will become a local government chairman. Our local government chairman will become mayors. I mean, we will work it out, but embrace us as a state. And some people say, that's not true. That's not possible. How is even that possible? In the Bible, it happened. People say, buy us, because money fill it. But in 1965, it happened. The nation called Singapore went to the nation Malaysia and appealed to Malaysia to embrace Singapore as a state in Malaysia. It actually happened. And Malaysia actually accepted Singapore as a state. And the leaders of Singapore had to accept a lesser compromise of expression. And Malaysia became the country, and Singapore became a state in, in Malaysia. However, Malaysia itself was a struggling entity in the world. They quickly woke up to the idea that embracing a poor Singapore will only make them poorer. So what did they do? They disengaged from the merger, and Singapore went on its own. That was when the young man Lee Kuan Yew came into force and then killed communism, embraced the mass education of the people, installed enterprise education, and lived his country in 30 years from first world, from third world to first world. And then he did that intelligently and with a lot of discipline and strength that the per capita income of Singapore, of the average Singaporean, is higher than that of their colonial master Britain, right? right? So, and this is a small little naval base somewhere in, in Asia, right? All of that was going on. So it's going to happen again. And I can go on and on. There is an implosion that is ahead. Now, you and I probably will not be here. Why? Because we've seen COVID. We've seen the impact of this pandemic. Listen to me. There is something superior to a pandemic on its way. And it's huge. That is going to require, actually, the disappearance of human body. I don't have time to explain that. But on a level, I can guarantee you that the greatest human crisis will come when bodies actually begin to vanish. For those of us who understand the contents of the future and the weight of prophecy, there's something called rapture which we define as a spiritual experience, but it's actually something contemporary that will be happening in the human life in years to come. 
and that will be the disappearance of the human body. And that will, as a matter of fact, define the greatest human crisis ever, greater than the First World War, greater than the Second World War, greater than the pandemic of 100 years ago, greater than whatever COVID is doing right now. So how do we deal with that positioning? Let me announce to you real quick because of time. Whether you like it or not, this year is a bad year, B-E-D. This is a bad year. A bad year is a year that every year ahead of it, at least for 50 years, will rest on. So the character of the next 50 years will be defined by the contents of this bad year. Look at how many human beings we have lost this year. All we are trying to do is to get into a new decade. We are just trying to get into a new decade. Listen, if you are alive on January 1, 2021, a big responsibility is on you. You will be answering a higher call. You will be releasing yourself to a purpose that transcends you. To be alive in 2021, January 1st, will be a mighty privilege and, of course, a massive commission. You've got to understand that. Now, listen, these 10 years will be defined by four things. Number one is the fading of powers and voices as we know it. Just do a 30-year game. Add 30 years to anybody above 60 today. In 30 years' time, in 10 years' time, in 20 years' time, they will either be at the departure lounge of life, ready to take the flight, or they will have taken the flight. The idea is that something is visiting us. And the next 10 years, 20, 30 years is the fading of powers. Add 30 years to Donald Trump, he's gone. Joe Biden, is gone. Bill Clinton, gone. Hillary Clinton, gone. Buhari, gone. Uh, uh, Atiku, gone. Uh, Chinubu, gone. Obasan Joshua, gone. I mean, by the time you add all of those years, and this is not a curse. This is not pulling people down. This is not trying to attack people. This is just the fact of numbers. This is just the law, the science of numbers. It's called wear and tear. It's a guaranteed experience for the human life. And so I'm not crossing anybody. I'm not predicting doom. Whether you like it or not, you are a product. You have an expiry date in that one day you will die. It's the lot of everybody listening and me that is talking here, right? But the idea is that once you are 60 and above, you are in the generation I call the disappearing generation or the departing generation, and if I need to label that generation well, it is the wasteful generation. There is a wasteful generation that is going in the next 10, 20, 30 years. Now, there is another generation, which is called the interregnum generation. It's the generation between cause and effect. Let me assure you this. Punch me if you want. But if you are age 30, if you are between age 30 and 59, you are in the interregnum generation. If you are age 60 and above, you are in the disappearing generation, or what I call the wasteful generation. If you are in the age 30 to 59, you are in the interregnum, interregnum generation. You are between cause and effect. You are the instrument between cause and effect. For those who are Nigerians, listen to me. There is a lot of energy out there. Nigerians are expecting that that generation, 2023, will be the change. Let me say this with all humility. Please don't be angry. And if you do, God help you. But the idea is, if you are, if you are age 30 and 59, you cannot change Nigeria. It is not given to you to change Nigeria. No matter who is praying for you, no matter who is laying hands on you, no matter the diet you are committed to, no matter the exercise program you have given yourself to, no matter how much books you are reading, it doesn't matter how many schools you are going to, you will not change Nigeria. The transformation and the renaissance of Nigeria is not prophetically in your hand. The numbers of the nation is not in your generation. The best you are going to do is to prepare the next generation for that takeover. So there's another generation I call the takeover generation. They are between age 1 and 29 today. Between age 1 and 29. If you add 30 years to their age, they will still, if, if, if it's 1, you'll be 31. If it's 10, you'll be 40. If it's 20, you'll be 50. If it's 30, you'll be 60. That generation is the renaissance and transforming generation. I call them the takeover generation. They are the ones that will save Nigeria. But the job of anyone between age 30 and age 59 today is the, the instrument between cause and effect. You are the one that will be the, the force to defeat the disappearing generation. Right now, there is a contention at the gates of destiny 
between the disappearing generation and the interregnum generation. Can I tell you the winner? The winner is the interregnum generation. You are going to win. It may not be in 2023, but 2023 will be a catalyst and a beginning. But change that we transform this country will not come. And so understand your role so that you can align intelligently. Your goal is your, 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 your generation is designed, um, called, wired, programmed to defeat the wasteful generation, the disappearing generation, and to receive power from them and to manage that power for at least 30 years. And then you are going to hand over that power to the takeover generation. Listen to this. Your case is like David. You are not being given the duty to do that, not because of a lack of intelligence, not because you are not brilliant, not because you have not gone to the school, not because you are not young, not because you are not strong. The reason why it's not given to you is because your hands are soiled. The wasteful generation has successfully installed a virus into your life such that what it takes destiny-wise to fulfill that mandate has been decolored. And so you can achieve something. And don't think that is strange, particularly if you are a Christian, you understand the awesomeness of David, how David had all the resources to build the temple, all the experience to build the temple, all the wealth to break the temple, all the power to build the temple. But the Lord said, David, you are not going to build the temple. Your son, Solomon, will build the temple. Not for lack of intelligence, not for lack of logic, not for lack of wisdom, not for lack of experience, not for lack of capacity, not for lack of resources, but because your hands are soiled with blood. And so you cannot build the temple. Solomon will build the temple. But what you will do is you will prepare everything. You will prepare the money, the land, the structures, all the instruments will be done by you. You will leave everything available for Solomon. And Solomon will come to build. And the Bible said when Solomon built so well, the whole world came to see the protocol of Solomon, the peace and prosperity in the land of Solomon, in the kingdom of Solomon. That is what is going to happen in your case. And so understand that you are an interregnum. You are going to be between cause and effect. Ladies and gentlemen, the next 10 years of this country, this awesome, amazing black nation in the world, will be essentially, and that is also true for anyone anywhere in the world, the fading of powers and the fading of voices as we know it. Number two, the emergence of voices and, and powers as we are yet to know. But that emergence is not happening in the palaces. It's not happening in the big kingdom. You know where it is happening? The underdogs. All of what you are seeing all over the world, you see underdogs are rising. This is the decade of the underdogs. The next 30 years is the decade of the underdogs. That is why they are started with hoodlums, we call them, back home, and a lot of things are happening at that level. But when you go look at it, it is the rise of the underdogs, unto good or unto evil, unto good conscience or unto destruction. Underdogs are rising, right? And the custodians of power must pay attention to the underdogs and intentionally give them power because the only way to be re to remain powerful forever is not to keep power is to give power you will give that power or it will be taken from you it's just the way it is and I'm not speaking of violence or an army. I know nothing of that. I speak prophetically that human beings must learn how an era has ended. You must look at yourself and understand that you don't have more than 10 years. No matter how we, what doctor is working with you, no matter who is helping you, in the next 10 years you are gone. 15 or 20 tops you are gone. Your generation is at the departure lounge of life ready to take the flight. Don't fight the problem. Decide it and get statemently and begin to wear the garment of honor and responsibility and begin to help children to see the light so that you can determine the weight of your legacy. Donald Trump is architecting a different history for himself, not because of what he has done in the last four years. All of that characterizes his arrival, but the way he's curating his departure is enough. You know, good luck, Jonathan misbehaved for many years, but because his departure was well curated, he somehow came into a good history right? And got a good positioning. 
At times, your departure is more important than your arrival. And the season of management of that departure can pretty much give you a legacy despite the contents of your history. And right now, you can position and begin to understand that departure is critical. If you manage it well, history can keep you in a good place. If you manage it wrongly, all the contents of your unguardedness of your history will be recycled and lauded to the whole world. Understand that. And that generation is happening. The third thing that will be happening is the rise of the church. And I say this with all humility, just in case you're not a Christian listening to me. But I wish I could say something else. But what is going on is the arrest of academics and education. And that is the final thing I'm going to say. And the birth of revelation. And I'm going to connect that to Cain and Abel, and that's to, to Cain rather, and your positioning in that. Now see this light and see it well. Academics has ruled the world. The goal of academics essentially was to create regulation and order. So without academics, we wouldn't know a lawyer, we wouldn't know a doctor, we wouldn't know a surgeon. We would just be there experimenting and making errors, right? Trying and errors. But academics allows us to know that this is a lawyer, this is an engineer. This is an architect. Academics does all of that. But academics, if you think that is the least of what God can do or what is going on in life or the highest level of clarity, you make a mistake. The highest level of clarity with man is education. What is education? Education is what you teach yourself. Academics is what you are taught. And the force of education, essentially, is to do things at a level that permits you to experience your environment, one, Question it deep enough, to to find the options that exist in it, three, and to know the options to embrace as a matter of supreme importance and urgency. That is education. And education gave birth to Microsoft, gave us Apple, gave us Facebook, gave us Henry Ford, gave us all the machines and equipment of the last 100 years. But guess what? Something superior has come. It's called revelation. And revelation is superior to education and academics. And its goal is going to be curated with a relationship, a working, talking relationship with the creator. That is the most critical agenda of the 2020s. You need to come into a zone, a power zone, that transcends the limits, the limits of logic and intelligence, and which place you in a place of power and understanding. Now, you will keep a relationship with God just as Cain did, but that will not be enough. You will need to align in that relationship such that while Cain struggled essentially with the limits of that human um, waste of not having the spiritual experience, right? The spiritual condition. You are blessed today with the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ that you can assess relationship and strength at another level. So your brainstorming room has shifted from just your boardroom to the presence of God. Your ears must now be aligned with the leap of the master. That is what is not present in the awesomeness of the relationship with God that Cain has. And so if we find the cure to cancer in this decade, I will not be shocked. If we find the cure to HIV or some of the most complex diseases, if we find the next level of the internet in this decade, I will not be shocked. If we find the next level of social media in this decade, I will not be shocked. Because there is an experience that is visiting man that God himself is the architect, the builder, and the curator. And ours is to align, to gain understanding, and to align. For time, I will close by reminding you that whether we like it or not, the spiritual condition is no longer separated from the affairs of everyday life. The affairs of everyday life is called contemporary life, otherwise called popular culture. That is going to be in unison with what is going on in the heavenlies. For those of us with spiritual awareness, for those of us with spiritual condition, you are the new underdog, and this is your decade. And you need to begin to align with the principles that you know that define the constitution of your own kingdom and the character of your own kingdom. The Bible says you do not receive because you don't ask. Then it said even when you ask, you ask for the wrong motive, hoping to spend it on your pleasures. Affairs of state, affairs of the kingdom, will be the dominant expression that you must embrace and ask yourself what is the benefit of the kingdom for that which I do. 
If you want a car, what is the benefit of that car to the kingdom? If you want a big house, what does the kingdom take away from that big house? If you want a big bank account, what does the kingdom take away from that bank account? You need to come to that place of strength and power. I pray today, I pray today for wisdom, for insight, for revelation in the name of Jesus. I permit myself, I permit the grace of God in this house today. I permit all that is of heaven in this room to begin to work at a dimension for everyone listening. For those who will listen later, there's no distance in the realm of the spirit. I don't care if you are a Muslim. I don't care if you are Buddhist. I don't care if you are, if you are an atheist. I don't care if you are agnostic. I don't care who you are. I don't care if you are a Christian or not. I speak an interruption into your life today. And it's a positive interruption that releases you into yours and that position you into what is ahead of you and give you a stake under the sun in the decade that we have entered strategically in the name of Jesus. So I have declared and so shall it be in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.